Okay, real work. The uh, draft historic film guidance. Okay. We received 11 sets of comments. Uh, some of them were, of course, joint comments among uh, our several of you banded together, like the SDSA Association. So there are a lot of comments for that. And um, so we'll be going through, I just wanted to touch on some of the, the common issues that came up in the themes. And I'm not going to tell you how we're, we're going to address them, partly so that we can have a discussion, partly because we haven't had the internal discussion that uh, I would need before we'd be able to say definitively that this is what we think about that. But to, to group things in and uh, let me know if I well let me know if I miss anything. But really, I, this was not supposed to be a like detailed. I'm going to try to capture everything on these slides discussion. So you know, I have your comments. We write them. Uh, if they're not here, it's just because they're not on the slides. Uh, but kind of what are the common things of the like, kind of how one fits in the weight of evidence, uh, the lines of ed evidence, the conceptual site model, the ability to, to look at what's going on at a site, uh, internalize it, think about it, and then draw conclusions from it. That the work that one supposes that the LSP is charged to do, exercising their professional judgment, uh, versus, oh, here's here are recommended, recommended approaches. Here's what we think will we'll do it. Here, here's a list of numbers. Um, and and you see comments actually kind of on both sides of this. And this is one of these internal struggles that we, we talk about over and over again. And, it should, and it's trying to find the right balance of, uh, and, and the best words to describe it, I think. Because you're up front in the disclaimer. And you know I, I want to say throughout the document, but I'm sure, well, obviously, because of the comments we got, you know, it may or may not be as clear as we want it to be. But you know, we do take to heart the, that this is guidance, and that what we describe in the recommendations are ways that we think if you did this, you can kind of cover yourself, and, and it's a way of systematically going through it and making sure that kind of all the boxes are checked and that you're thinking of and addressing all of the issues that might come up, but there are other ways of doing it. These are not, you know, unless it says must, shall, and usually with the regulatory citation, it's not a requirement, it's not the regulation. You're trying you're very hard, and you're probably not 100% successful, but that's why we have a public comment period, to really try to differentiate between those musts and shalls with ties to the regulatory requirements versus, you know, you really need to think about this. You really need to uh, think about that. And if you take um, one of the things in here was um, you're particularly assessing the extent of the fill. And as, as you're going down, I believe there's a recommendation that, well, you know, you should kind of go, go down and go a little bit beyond. And you know, if you go a couple feet beyond what you think is the end of the fill and you're not seeing you know, additional stuff, then you can you know, probably stop there. You have a good sense. You should feel comfortable with that point that if you come down a couple feet beyond the fill, you know, boring and, and you demonstrate that, that you've now defined the extent of the fill you know, vertically. Uh, and, and that's probably true. People raise the, the question of, well, you know, that might might not need to do that in all cases. There might be site-specific reasons why uh, you know, going just to the edge of the fill would be appropriate. Uh, and if I can justify that, I should be allowed to do that. Uh, and it's just that balance that uh, how how much detail uh, should we put in to kind of other alternative approaches. Uh, you could see, say, well, you could go down two feet beyond what you think is the edge of the fill and, and describe what's below it, show that it's natural, and then you have to find the bottom. Or you could do X, Y, and Z with shallower sampling depth. Uh, we're, we're trying to make this manageable and relatively short and direct, and not trying to describe all of the different possible permutations. But we do want to be clear that if we if we say if you go down beyond two feet beyond what you think is the extent of the fill, you know, that's certainly sufficient. You know, that would meet our what we view as performance standard for defining the vertical extent of the fill. If you have another approach, fine, you know, do it. Just by lay again throughout all of this, it's laying out your thought process. Uh, you know, 
provide the justification of you know, what is the conceptual site model? Why does the data that you have make sense to you? And how can you describe it so it makes sense for everybody else? So that somebody else reading it will, will inevitably come to the same conclusion that you, you do. Uh, we try to strike that balance. Uh, and you know, those are the comments that we get. Are uh, you know, the balance what we strike, the balance we strike, and how we describe it is not going to work for everybody uh, because you see you have the gamut of people that are asking us. You know, could you give us more numbers? You know, we like numbers. We like tables. You know, could you could you give us more detail? Could you include additional data? Uh, which other people among you, among you know, the, the grand universe? view that as DP being too prescriptive. They're, they're providing too much detail. If you provide a table with numbers, does that imply, even if DP says the right thing, that you don't have to use these numbers, you can use professional judgment, you can use other documentation, uh, but it doesn't really imply that you want them to use those numbers. And so we're trying to strike that balance. Uh, it hopefully will, will succeed. Yeah. I mean, I think you're right, this comes up across the board um, with every guidance document. I think that's probably ever been produced by DP. And I think it's great to have clarity for presumptive certainty, like you're saying, like here is one way that you can feel comfortable achieving the performance standard. I think the problem that we've seen in the past is during audit and enforcement actions with staff saying, well, you, you know, really sticking to the guidance and saying, well, you deviated here. Well, we explained why we deviated and we provided, you know, lines of evidence and technical justification, but somehow that, that just makes a lot of, um, I think, staffers very uneasy and um, frankly maybe CYA a little bit that, well, you know, okay, I hear what you're saying, but you still didn't do it in this fashion. And um, so I think that's what a lot of LSPs um, have struggled with. And I think you're right. There's there's a gamut and a, a huge variability in LSPs comfort level. And some people really want that lookup list and that safety. And that's fine if, if, if that's the way you want to do it. But I guess I would, I think there was a little bit of a maybe prescriptive tone in one of the earlier drafts. I think this one actually was a lot better for the historic bill, but I think, like you said, it's a balancing act. And I think that that needs to go out to not only the regulated community and LSPs, but also internally to DDP. There's a five minute moment. Sorry. Yeah, no, no, I mean, it's an idea for doing a five minute moment. On the scene. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. It, it, we also, yeah, we see there's the range of the LSPs as well, and, and uh, in those, when we have those discussions about the technical justification and alternatives and guidance, you know, we, we see the range, you know, you're acknowledging kind of your point about DEP staff, there's also kind of the flip side, of course, that I, I feel, you know, I should point out, <laughs> it's, it's a two-way street. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we do have uh, people that come in and in this, the, the concept of LSP professional judgment uh, sometimes is uh, is taken to mean that I'm an LSP, I get to judge. And in the, in the, the level of, 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 of thought and documentation is is minimal, and it's more, well, it, that's my opinion. You know, deal with it. Um, that may be a little bit over the top, but, but not that far. Uh, and which is why, you know, in, in my view, that it, it really is the thought process, and that's that going back to it. And not everybody has uh, the same ability of describing kind of what their mind is going through. Some people, you know, jump, can look at information and data, and and you know, it, it's a form of brilliance. You know, they can jump to conclusions from it, and you know, often the right conclusions from it, but have a hard time describing how they got there. And it's it's like showing your work in, in school. You don't necessarily get all the points for having the right answer. You you, know, you have to show what it is, and and that applies both to to the LSPs and to DEP staff. You know, we want you know our staff to think about why are we 
Uh, why do we require something? Why do we recommend something? What it is that we're trying to get at and, and consider the alternative ways of getting there. And yeah, we'll be talking about this for decades. Oh no. But I, I thought. <laughs> the, the, <laughs> Seven years. <laughs> um, but I think the, the disclaimer at the beginning of, of the historic bill policy is you know, again one of our you know, ongoing attempts to describe what it means what what it means to be a policy and what our approach is. I, I think you know, that evolves, and I, I think I hope I think it improves. I think this is kind of one of our better attempts at it. Um, how much is too much? Meaning that that primarily primarily composed of language that's in there, uh, and, or you know, how little is the minimus enough? Uh, there, there are a whole bunch of questions related to uh, this, and, and actually the, the primarily composed of language, um, which is kind of general. <laughs> uh, this is one of the cases where uh, people would like a little bit more detail, uh, and, and would like the department to come out and say, you know, 51%. Uh, is primarily composed of versus 49%, uh, rather than having more kind of a judgment uh, issue. Uh, and, and this includes things like uh, there's there's discussion about here if you find pockets of fill or layers of fill and kind of try to, how to deal with that, and, and and some suggestions about folding that into the overall primarily composed of rather than focusing on the pockets or the layers. Um, and then the, the de minimis really gets to, um, well, among other things, it includes, as you know, the definitions of historic film and anthropogenic background rule out some compounds and say, well, it's not historic, it's not historic film, it's not uh, anthropogenic background. And kind of an underlying, and it was expressed in several ways, but the concept was, well, but what if you have really low levels here? What, what levels are de minimis? And, and how do you define de minimis? Um, you know, is it, and what people tend to focus on are the, the S1 standards and the RCS1s or, or things like that. And one, one of the things I, I need to think more about is, is I think there's a kernel of something in there about uh, the overall process is the, the ability to, to close out a site and demonstrate that it's meeting both the new significant risk standard and the and or its anthropogenic background or historic field that you, know, you have all of the pieces of this puzzle accounted for in some way and the combination of those results in a permanent solution. And and some of it's going to be because it's a continuum of concern and it poses, it has potential to pose a risk, but we demonstrate eventually that it doesn't. Uh, and some of the, the constituents that are there are part of historic fill and thus are not included in the risk process. And and what what I'm struggling with, not struggling, but I, I think there's an answer in there that's not clear in the document, but I think it can be clear, is, uh, and I think people were trying to get at it as well, that if, if things are there that wouldn't fit the historic fill definition, but they are less than the, R the RCs or less than the S1 standards, you're trying to get at the, the point of, well, it doesn't really pose a risk. Uh, so it should be okay. And and I think some of the comments were, and thus, you should be able to include it in the historic fill definition. And I think it, it's kind of what part of the line on. I, I look at those comments and I think, well, if it's if it's that low, then it should be relatively simple to put, to show that it's there, it's at low levels, it's part of the no significant risk. So it, it almost depends on kind of which side of the line, what, what box you put it in to try to include it in the justification that overall the site poses, um, poses no significant risk and is eligible for a permanent solution. And I, maybe, maybe part of it is, does the presence of those low levels rule out the ability to you know, claim everything else that is legitimately, you know, or might legitimately be historic fill, does that break everything back? And, and maybe that's what people are concerned about. So I, I think there's a way of, of being clear about it, that you know, low levels doesn't, of something that is not part of historic fill, still allows you to make the historic fill uh, justification for the appropriate constituents. Uh, 
we just need to make sure that those low levels of those other chemicals that are not historic fill are appropriately addressed uh, in the risk assessment. It poses no significant risk, so that everything is accounted for, and you know, if the site is truly a combination of low risk and historic fill, then that is eligible and appropriate for a permit solution. So I think there's something there, uh, and I think we can work that out. Uh, there are other, a whole bunch of definitional issues, the, the sub-areas and the horizontal layers, the uh, somebody brought up slag, the reworked soils, the coal and wood ash definition, doesn't it just, you know, how does it fit or not fit, um, things like drink spoils. Uh, these are, some of these might be able to be dealt with in guidance, others might be uh, regulatory tweaks, and you know, we promise that, you know, almost threatened that, you know, this section of the reg, the definition of the historic filling that's a good factor is going to be something that's going to evolve over time as we figure out what works and what doesn't. And so these, to the extent that it's not addressed in guidance or can't be addressed in guidance, uh, it would be on the table for, you know, consideration and discussion as part of the trailer package that you know, I mentioned earlier. So, so they are there. Uh, and I appreciate people mentioning it so that it make, we make sure that it's on the list for those eventual great discussions. Uh, applicability to releases on fill. So if you have a release fill that's there and then a release occurs on top of it, you have fill that's on top of releases, you have fill beside a release, you have fill that goes on forever, it's fill beside fill beside fill, kind of questions of you know, how far do you go to, to document that it's fill and you need to extend, you know, particularly the, the off property issue, how far, if so off property, property do you go, and how do you draw that line between the release of oil and hazardous material that creates the site that you're concerned about and need to close up versus the fill uh, and make sure that the fill, the release doesn't necessarily rule out your ability to make that uh, background determination or historic fill determination. Uh, oh, this is back to the point we were talking about before. Well, back to question I, I have a laundry list of, of very specific technical recommendations that should be excised from the document. Uh, and conversely, specific requests for technical recommendations in discussion that should be added to the document. Uh, that's not. Uh, and then uh, a laundry list of you know, chemical specific stuff. And, and I think the, uh, the fact that we got so many comments on, on this kind of, I think, reinforced the, the decision that we made to actually try to elaborate and provide some discussion on, on these. Uh, and, and quite frankly, the comments weren't as bad as I expected them to be. <laughs> Once you get into the chemical specific nature, um, the, yeah. So we'll, we'll be going to so none of them. I, I think are, if I'm remembering correctly, uh, were were horrible. I mean, there there are some things that are continually problematic, like asbestos and PCBs, uh, things like that, which I guarantee you will continue to be problematic um, as we move, move ahead. Well, I mean, realistically, right. we're not. <laughs> This, this policy is not going to solve those problems. Uh, there are, you know, in some, some things, they, you know, they're looking at, at, at all of this in the bigger picture, there, there are things that we can address in this policy we hope to. There are things that we can address in our upcoming regulations that we hope to. Uh, there are things that may be addressed uh, in kind of other department-wide. Uh, programs. You know, as, as you may know, there were listening sessions recently in the spring about the asbestos program. Uh, and some of the comments that came in through there it included uh, comments to the effect that both EP should take up the asbestos and soil issue. And uh, so you know, there's, there's a chance that we may be looking at that again as well. So there may be other venues for dealing with some, some of these. Uh, so you know, that that's part of the, you know, will continue to be issues, you know, long into the future, but we're, we're going to try to deal with them, you know, each step along the way, and uh, maybe not solve all the problems, but we'll, we'll get there eventually. 
Uh, tables of miscellaneous edits. I'd like to do miscellaneous edits the best. The, the, the easiest way to read. I, I reach all of them. Uh, and, and the tables, <laughs> the, the tables, um, uh, you have to, the, there are some inconsistencies that some people pointed out uh, that we'll, we'll try to address as well. And you know, uh, table one, uh, which I think is nice and simple and clear, and has nothing to do with the fact that you know, I wrote it years and years and years ago. Uh, I thought that's a nice, clear one. Uh, table two, uh, you know, we were trying to do something a little bit different, kind of incorporating you know, discussions, uh, being perhaps making it less, you know, here's the chemical, here's the number, and trying to condense and, and summarize some issues, some of the thoughts, some of the considerations for, for different chemicals giving a range of different uh, uh, values, uh, talking about different uh, citations and sources. And I think it, it was broader. It was partly intended, I think, to kind of throw out issues and, and perhaps it, didn't, it wasn't quite as explicit as it needed to be, but to say, well, you know, here are some of the things that should be considered. Here are some of the, the sources, uh, citations you might uh, look at, and it might not particularly fit exactly your situation, but you know, uh, so it was more general, it was more nebulous, it was, um, uh, I think it was less prescriptive, or, or trying to be less prescriptive, and more, here are things you, you know, here's a range of things, you know, think about it, you, know, you might be able to incorporate it into your conceptual cycle. Um, yeah, we can, we'll look at that and see if, you know, how we can improve it. Um, but it, I think it was partly an attempt not to be as prescriptive and to be more throwing out things to be considered. Yeah. 